All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 16th day of December in the year of our Lord, 2023. I did two videos in the last previous two days about uh, uh, Christian nationalism because it seems to be uh, an issue out there. Uh, G3 and others, there's internal problems with it, feuding back and forth a bit. But it is much worse than anybody has mentioned uh, yesterday, I posted a video called Ch Christian Nationalism Serves Satan, based on a, uh, a small, short video by Jeff Durbin of Apologetic, Apologia Church in the Phoenix, Arizona area. On the other end of the uh, um, theonomist axis, there is Doug Wilson up at um, Moscow, Idaho, and he has Canon Press up there, another another. Uh, as well as other things, Christ Church. Uh, they do a lot of his young people do a lot of work on the internet, just like Apologia. And his publishing ministry published this book by Stephen Wolf uh, last year, 2002, 2022. And it seems to me, from when I was looking the other day at this Christian nationalism stuff, that a lot of people are using this as their guide. Uh, and uh, Wilson is probably the center of it, the strongest center of theonomy. But this book is not about theonomy. It's about theocracy, the rule of God. Not the rule of law, but the rule of God himself. Through a man, a vicar, like the Pope. A vicar of God, to quote this book directly. The Prince as a vicar of God. So uh, we need to take a look at the issue of the object of this is to, to overthrow the current government or governments like the government of the United States. And it justifies um, that act, the act of overthrowing government, and it justifies th that act by a minority group of people in contradiction to the, real, the will of the majority. So basically, a small group of people for the common good, what they believe the common good is, the will of God, can overthrow the government and install another government that they believe is more in line with the government that would serve Christ or God. And, and it doesn't matter what the majority thinks. And then you install a person, and his idea is a single person, what he calls the Christian prince, who is a Puritan, totalitarian, theocratic individual who can create laws out of nothing and impose them on everyone. And this book gets into a lot more of the details what do you do with heretics? What do you do with unbelievers? Basically, do whatever you want with them. Uh, what would the Puritans have done in New England? That would basically give you the idea of what he has in mind. So if you find a person that you believe is a witch because she lives out in the woods by herself and she's an old lady, well, you can burn her at the stake then. <laughs> she might not agree with your religion. She doesn't show up in church. That, that's a serious enough crime to burn her probably. Uh, especially if you got a panic going on about witches like they did in Salem. There was some popular Christian literature imported about the, the danger of witches, and it caused a panic, which is what started that the Salem witch trials, and it was pretty bizarre. Uh, Christians don't do that. We don't burn witches. They're around. We don't burn them. We'll talk to him and say, 
hey, I can give you something a whole lot better than that. It's called Jesus Christ. How would you like eternal life for free? Along with a new heart, a new spirit. Along with knowing God, being a daughter of God instead of a child of Satan. Give you something better than your broom. Okay, so let's look at this, especially the issue of the government that they want to replace, our current government. Uh, the, the, the idea of democracy is a no-no here. Uh, the idea, well, this man really loves the idea of dictatorship, including in the family. So, oh, by the way, he's a fairly young guy. He's got a degree, a Ph.D. in political science from the University of Louisiana. He's got a wife currently and, and nine children. I don't know if I would want to hang a lot on the long-term enduring uh, um, endurance of that relationship based on his attitudes. Uh, so let's take a look here at what he is calling for as far as a Christian nationalism, the rule in a what he calls Christian nationalism. This is not the Christian nationalism you think it is. Most people are going to see that and say, you know, yeah, I guess I'm a Christian. And yes, I, I'm opposed to globalism, so I guess I'm a nationalist. Like Trump. That's not what it is. It is a false label to get to hook people. It is about theocratic Puritan rule. How many people want to be ruled by an all-powerful theocratic Puritan government? Almost none, but it doesn't matter because he justifies overthrowing the American Constitution and the American government and installing this Puritan, totalitarian, theocratic prince. Once in, there's no way to get rid of him unless he suffers a misfortune. Like the Pope. Like the Pope. Uh, you can't, there's, there's no authority over him. So it's just like the Pope, uh, he's above everything, which is why the Reformers all labeled the Pope Antichrist, the, or the papacy Antichrist, because it exalts himself over God and over all that is considered uh, objects of devotion or worship. Exalts himself. It's like human, humanism. Exalts itself above all. It's called sin. It's called sin. The man of sin, which is the category, definitely, uh, and perhaps an individual, but more likely a category of people, like the children of Adam, the unregenerate are the man of sin, children of Adam. The Prince, 279. Relatively thick, a thick book, by the way. It's 400, it's over, well, 470-some pages. C civil leadership is difficult to describe. No, I'm on the wrong page. What am I supposed to be on? Two, 279. Uh, top of the page, 279. Um, so I will primarily use Prince, quote, on, uh, quote, as the mediator of the nation's will for itself. The nation's, so the Prince is essentially an embodiment of the nation's will or what the nation ought to will. Um, it's reminiscent of a certain Austrian in the first half of the 20th century and how he functioned as a ruler in that land, uh, not in the land of Austria, but that was included. You know, what YouTube algorithm uh, has certain words it doesn't like. So we have to speak in a little bit of a coded way. But yes, uh, very much so. And when, if you ever watch that man speak, even if you don't know German, uh, you see this transformation take place. He had a, a way of being able to, to bond with the German people, the, uh, become an embodiment of their fears and anxieties and their ambitions, too. 
and express that to them. Tell them exactly what they wanted to hear. And it was almost he like he'd warm up and it's almost like a spirit came upon him and whoosh, all of a sudden he came bigger, it became bigger than life. You could see it, even if you don't understand German. You could hear it in his tone. You could see how the people react. There's this, there's this dynamic that takes place that is uh, amazing and unique. And if you see that, you can sort of wonder why, uh, you, can, you can understand why they followed him and worshipped him, literally worshipped him. You know, the, the salute with him driving by in a vehicle, you'd see these lines of people and adoring women just throwing flowers and throwing themselves and everything else at him. Uh, it just um, an object of worship, the, uh, the savior of the nation kind of thing, a messiah for the German state and the Austrians and everything else. So I primarily use the uh, use quote unquote Prince as a mediator of the German uh, the nation's will for itself. This title denotes both an executive power, uh, one who administers the law, and personal eminence in relation to the people. Not just the executive function, but a position of eminence, an embodiment. The prince is a first of his people, one whom the people can look upon as father and a protectorate of the country. Again, we've seen this before. I'm just giving a good, well-known example that's not too far back in history. And the results. We know what the results of that were, don't we? I hope. I don't know if they teach that anymore in school, but... I am not calling for a, mon a monarchical regime over every civil polity, and certainly not an autocracy. Autocracy is self-rule. Uh, rule out of yourself. Autocracy. So you've um, uh, humanism, the idea of a man being a law unto himself, that whatever is, the man exalting himself above everything else. So whatever man says is, is the rule. So that's... Uh, a ruler that rules out of his own self would be an autocrat, not out of anything else, not subject to law or any other thing. But essentially, this is what this guy's talking about, too, an autocrat. Though I envision a measured and theocratic, there's a code, clear word there to be worried about, theocratic, meaning direct rule by God. Uh, theonomy is... God's law rules, the law of the revealed law of God, the law of Moses, applied to civil law somehow, which is never quite clear how you do that. How you translate a law given to a particular people for a particular time into a law for some other country. And they usually talk about uh, general equity, taking the principles of the law and translating it into another situation and applying it which is a tricky job. And since the law is, doesn't save anybody and is not given for that purpose, it is, uh, was fulfilled in Christ. It no longer serves a purpose like that. It never saved anybody at all. It only kills because it condemns. It reveals sin, but that's all. It doesn't cure the problem. What's the point? Civil law is already theonomic. You look at our laws, you can find the roots of them in the, in the laws of Moses. A lot of them. Even some of the more obscure laws like safety regulations on, on the, in the workplace, OSHA. Uh, there are, are laws like that in the book of Moses, like you're supposed to put a, a fence, a parapet around the top of your roof, like a patio then. They didn't have yards. They had patio, uh, the roof. So they go up on the roof in the cool of the evening or, or eat up on the roof. They didn't have much room in the houses. And so you were to put a wall around the outside so people wouldn't accidentally step off the roof. Love your neighbor as yourself for the safety of your neighbor. It's just an application of that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, those kind of things are present in the laws today. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. It used to be that, well, 
It used to be thou shalt not commit adultery used to be a law too. And even now there's still, uh, you can bring civil charges against someone for that, uh, for um, estrange, estrangement of affections or for breaking a marriage covenant or something. You could bring a charge of breach of contract. There's, there's civil actions you can take too. So it's there in the military, unless they've changed it, adultery was a criminal offense because it affected the cohesion of the, of the military force. Committing adultery with somebody, other officers or somebody else's wife, you know, can cause strain within the organization. Like one person trying to kill the other one. So it's there. I mean, that's where natural law comes in, too. Uh, it, it's, it's of God, and it does show, a, it manifests itself in the fact that there is like a universe, certain universal standards that are uh, considered true, uh, right and wrong in all nations, like mur laws against murder. Whether there's law or not, we know it's wrong. So there's the, why do you need to try to translate the law of Moses into another manifestation of God's law when the, God's law is already manifest there? Imperfectly, but everything is going to be imperfect. It doesn't accomplish true good anyway. Can't lead anyone to salvation. Other, all it does is show you're a sinner. That's its only saving purpose, is to show you you're lost and going to hell and you need a savior. Because you're guilty because you're a sinner. Condemned because you're a sinner. Under a sentence of death because you're a sinner. When you realize that, then you start looking for a savior. That's its only, only benefit as far as the gospel. You don't even need that. You only need the, you can just use the two great commandments. They'll condemn everybody all the time. <clears throat> So he envisions a theocratic Caesarianism, a Caesar that's a theocrat. The prince is a world shaker of our time who uh, brings Christian people to self-consciousness. That's called wokeism. Self-conscious about who you are, just like a certain individual did that with the German people, brought them to a self-consciousness of their identity as opposed to the identity of others in their midst, which were to be eliminated. Because they were not part of that identity that that man postulated. <sighs> Brings a Christian people there's only one Christian people. There's only one Christian nation. That's the nation of Christ. A holy people. A royal priesthood. A people for God's own possession. To a self-consciousness and who in his rise restores their will for their good. That's exactly what that guy did. He also used Christianity when it suited him, when he was manip manipulating people. In, felt, in fact, the, the belt buckles of the military read something like, um, what is it? Gott mit uns, God with us. God is with us on their military belt buckle. I probably mutilated the German, but haven't seen those images in a while. Haven't needed to see them. The prince is a fitting title for a man of dignity and greatness of soul who leads a people to liberty, virtue, godliness, to greatness. Well, that's not what this guy will do. Let's go to another quote, page 287. Uh, 286, excuse me. Divine office. 
w w there's another man that claims to occupy a divine office, a particularly divine office, in a very big, fancy building in Rome. We're in the room. Uh, the prince, as a civil leader, this is art of uh, subtitle four, a divine office here, two eighty six. A prince, a civil leader, holds a office on behalf of God, the Creator. The principal and supreme end of the civil magistrate, as such, writes Turretin. He was a a Calvinist polemicist. And that's a commentary that's written in the uh, affirm, deny thing uh, style. And it is, we affirm this, we deny what the Catholics teach. We affirm this, we deny what the Catholics teach, that kind of stuff. It's a polemic. Not re really even an apology, it's a polemic. It's not a true commentary or anything like that. It's, it's just a, a polemic. Verbal warfare. Propaganda of sorts. Uh, is he an authority for anything? Other, does he speak for anyone other than Turretin? Not really. So the, uh, the civil magistrate, these are probably all taken out of context, um, is the glory of God, the creator, conservator of the human race, the ruler of of the world. Glory of God the Creator, I think, is what's supposed to be. Put commas in there. It's not quite clear. I don't think the magistrate is the creator. <laughs> it is a natural office required by the nature of man. No, it's not. It was an office ordained by God because of the fall. It's not a natural office that man in his uh, original state requires because God is actually present in man in his original state. There is no break in communication between God and man. Man was to operate in complete harmony with God as the image of God in creation, the glory of God in creation. As Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, that is the image of God that you've fallen short of because the image of God is God <laughs> too. Christ is the image of God, the perfect image of God. He's the second Adam, but he's the perfect image of God because he is God. Only God can be the image of God. So Christ, God must be in you for you to fulfill your purpose as being the image of God. Not that difficult <laughs> to understand. And because all people fall short of that, they've all sinned because that's what your requirement is, your creative purpose to be that. You're not that. You're not achieving God's purpose. Therefore, you are not in proper relationship with your creator. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a natural office required by the nature of man, not true, whose functioning, uh, God ordained it to put somewhat of a break on sin. That's about all and to show us the fact that we're sinners, who's, uh, well, not the magistrate, but law itself, but the, uh, the magistrate is ordained by God as, a, as his servant, a minister of justice to, uh, as Paul says, the purpose of the magistrate is to punish evil and reward good. That's it. All this other stuff is gobbledygook. Man's flapping his jaws. Tongue wagging. He is not a steward or a uh, so what is it? Civil power. Excuse me, I'm skipping too much. Um, is ordering the, the purpose of the magisterial office is the ordering of civil society for commodious and pious living. Uh, sort of. No, it's a minister of justice. It bears the sword to punish evildoers, like to slay murderers. The law being for sinful human beings. Civil power being original to God, the prince mediates God's divine civil rule. God did not originate or decree authority to be his divine civil rule. No. It's for sinful men because they can't stand the presence of God's divine rule. 
And no, it doesn't work out very well as in the Exodus. Getting too close to God can be fatal if you're not reconciled to God. So there's God put separation between himself, like the law was separation between God and man. Because what happened when they got too close, they died because they were sinners. They would rebel because they didn't, they were sinners. And that brought the wrath of God. And there was no true atonement. God had not reconciled the world to himself. We live in the new covenant. God has reconciled the world to himself because Christ died for the sins of the whole world. So God doesn't have to deal with sinful men the way he had to do it in, in the Old Testament. And sometimes there he overlooked things looking forward to the cross, like David. David should have been put to death for adultery and murder. Instead, God didn't quite overlook that, but did not have David put to death. Because David trusted in him. David, as he said, blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impart Pute sin, count sin. He is not a steward and a simple administrator as if he simply promulgated a divinely prescribed civil code. In other words, not theonomy. This is not, he's not advocating theonomy. Rather, he makes public judgments in application of God's natural law which is pretty ephemeral. Show me natural law. I want to know what natural law actually says so I can compare it with the Word of God to see if it's God's law or not. You can't show me natural law. You can see the effects of natural law. There is somehow law is written on people's conscience or heart because they manifest they have a knowledge of right and wrong but you, it's not codified. So if you're going to take things out of natural law, how are you to know where it's really coming from? Because there's nothing there to see or to read. This is silly. So he makes public judgments in application of God's natural laws, effectively creating law. Though a derivative of natural law, yeah, you're claiming it. So you can just basically create laws out of thin air. You don't have to go through the messiness of a legislative process and voting on them and determining if it's the will of the people, supposedly. We all know that's not how it actually works anymore, but and probably never did, but nevertheless. At least it slows things down to have one man who is who thinks he's the uh, well, we'll see what he thinks he is. Um, decide. Arbitrarily, which is what it would be, that this is the law and has the power to enforce that. I suppose that would mean he had the power to create ex post facto laws too. pass a law against what you did in the past and then punish you for what you did in the past when it wasn't even a law. Because who's going to judge this guy? It's like the Pope, beyond judgment, subject to none except God himself. <laughs> he doesn't even subject himself to God, which is obvious. Uh, the Pope, or I mean the Prince, holds the most excellent office, exceeding even that of the church minister. Church members are, uh, minister is supposed to be a servant of the congregation. He has no authority or office in himself. In fact, when you talk about uh, the, the office of deacon or elder or bishop in the New Testament, it's not an office. That's the word the King James translators added. It's simply a brother to whom the congregation has set apart to carry out, make sure certain things are carried out properly. So he's given extra responsibilities in other words, like making sure the poor in the church are, are properly taken care of or whatever for a deacon or that God's word is properly taught and made sure that things are properly done in an orderly way in the church, which would be the elder or the bishop. 
These are not offices. They are people. Again, the word office is not present in the text. But this is Calvinism here, so. Uh, the the uh, prince holds the most excellent office, exceeding even that of the church minister, for he it is most like God. The prince, unlike the church minister, is a mediator. There's only one mediator, Christ. A vicar of God. A substitute for God. That's what vicar means, a substitute. You want to translate that, translate that into uh, Greek? Antitheos, anti-God. Or more commonly, antichristos, antichrist. Someone who exalts himself above all that is called God and every object of devotion. That's what you got here. A vicar of God in outward civil affairs. As Calvin said, Civil rulers represent the person of God as whose uh, substitutes they are in, in manner, they, uh, they, as whose substitutes they in a manner act. That's not representative of Calvin's view of civil authority, especially in relationship to the church. It may be a quote, but it's not Calvin's, it doesn't represent Calvin properly. For this reason, the prince is called a God in Scripture, Psalm 82.6. Well, what does that actually say? Psalm 82, 6 says, I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Oops, and all of you are sons of the Most High. So, Jesus quotes this, in fact, when some of the Pharisees attempt to stone him to death for declaring himself to be, uh, well, the I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And he asked, why are you stoning me to death? And they answered, because you, a man, make yourself out to be God. And then Jesus quotes this, and in the scriptures it is written, you are gods. If God called them, the, the, the Jews, gods, then why are you going to stone me to death for saying I am the Son of God? It was a rhetorical argument. So what is the context here? You know, who are you to, to, to kill me for that when God himself called you gods? Elohim. And let me make sure that's the right word. Elohim. Uh, and it can mean what? Divine, divine being, exceedingly, God, God, small, goddess, godly, gods, gods. Uh, great judges, mighty rulers, shrine. Those are the ways it's used in the King James, at least. Usage. So what is the context here of this? And does it fit uh, this idea of the prince being a god? Psalm of Asaph. God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. So God is a judge. God, God is a judge. Elohim as in God himself, Yahweh. As long as you judge unjustly, how long will you judge unjustly and, and show partiality to the wicked? So God is condemning the, the rulers and the justices among his people. How long will you vindicate, uh, vindicate the weak and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and destitute, rescue the weak and needy, deliver them out of the hand of the wicked? They do not know, nor do they understand. Talking about those who think they're gods, the rulers, they walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, and all of you are the sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, 
you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is thou who dost possess all the nations. So this is what God thinks about these people who, have, who are rulers, um, who he calls gods in the sense of judges, that uh, yes, you are, and you are all sons of the Most High, because you're my people, Israel. Nevertheless, you all die like men because you're sinners. So, is that the context? So, does that quote here justify uh, the prince as a god? I think that doesn't quite <laughs> do what he expects it to do. See, when you look at things like this, it's obvious. Uh, this guy could care less about what the Scripture says. He probably got this reference from somebody else that was arguing something similar and didn't actually look at the Scripture because he doesn't derive anything from Scripture. He doesn't use Scripture. This was just to justify calling the prince a god and to view him as a god. That's not what God is saying here. He said, no, you're just, real, you're just mere men, and I'll prove it to you. You're all going to die like men, too. Death, the great equalizer. Yeah, the great and mighty die like everybody else. For this reason, the prince is called a god in Scripture. <laughs> really? Hi. See, again, that check out the references. See how they misuse Scripture, and you'll know whether, whether they're speaking for God or not. And this guy is, is, a, is a loser. But he's a deceiver, and he will deceive people because he'll tell them what they want to hear. He'll tell them what Christian nationalism is, and they'll lead them to death because that's where this book leads. You do this, you're going to end up on the gallows. You're not going to end up with a Christian nation. You'll be hanging from a gallows somewhere. They'll probably reinstitute that just for you. The problem is they're going to blame everybody else, too. All Christians are going to be tarred and feathered if somebody tries to do this. I mean, that suits Satan. That's why he's doing this. The odds of this happening, this plan and this book happening, is almost zero. It's not going to happen. But if somebody tries to make it happen, uh, considering what happened with uh, January 6th, so if some, a group of Christians, well, uh, under Nero, what happened? Part of the city of Rome burned down. There's a lot of accusations that Nero himself did it because he wanted to, to expand his, some building projects. So he needed to clear some land. So the accusation was that, that uh, he fiddled and sang a song that he composed while the city burned. And what did he do? He shifted the, the blame to the Christians. And they found some poor guy that they got to confess to being an arsonist. And uh, because of that, there was a, a, a great persecution of Christians in Rome, including a lot of Christians being burned in Nero's garden on poles, uh, soaked, wrapped with uh, skins or materials soaked in uh, turpentine and, and pitch and everything else. And he burned them to illuminate his garden. You want to give them an excuse? They're not too particular about, about justice in Washington as it is. Look at, looking at what they do there, they call that justice. They don't like Christians as it is. If you go out there and make us look like a, somebody that's trying to overthrow the government, which is what this book is about, what do you think is going to happen? We will have real persecution in this country. I'll skip down a little bit. Calvin demonstrates the divine magnitude of the princely office, often in terms of presence in relationship to the people. 
I don't know where he's getting this from. Having the highest office on earth, the good prince resembles God to the people, only if they're idolaters. There is no such thing as a good prince except the Lord Jesus Christ. No such thing. There is none good but God alone. Indeed, he is the closest image of God on earth. Really? Jesus Christ is the only image of God that's ever been on earth. That this is this is beyond I don't know what. 289. It goes without saying, page 289, it goes without saying uh, that though the prince is a national god, he does not, indeed cannot, mediate salvific grace. No earthly office has such power. And Christ alone is the mediator of grace unto eternal life. Well, Christ alone is the only mediator, period, between God and man, not the prince. This man is a heretic. He denies the sole mediatorship of Christ. Okay, let's just go on. I don't wasting a lot of time on some of these. Uh, th page 321, he makes the... Uh, the Sabbath binding on all people. The, the princess has to require people keep the Sabbath. This is Puritan theocracy. Let's see. Is there anything else here that is particularly nasty? He has to punish heresy with death. Um, all this kind of nonsense. Oh, uh, the right of revolution. Page 346. There's a whole chapter on the right to revolution. Christians in the minority. So if you have a Christian nation, Christians are a minority, a small minority, you know, real Christians. Are Christians that want to participate in a revolution against the government are going to be a small minority because it's contrary to Christ. We're forbidden to do this. We're forbidden to take up the sword, to be the aggressor. And we're forbidden, we're told to be in subjection to the government. We'll look at that. Exactly what the scripture requires of people living in a godless country, a godless empire, under pagans, idolaters, and wicked people. Another question is whether a Christian people constituting a minority of a population under a civil government can revolt against a tyranny directed at them, and after successfully revolting, a minority, establish it over all the population of a, as a, a Christian commonwealth. The issue here centers on whether a Christian minority can establish a political state over the whole without the positive consent of the whole. In other words, a, minor, a minority imposing their view over the majority. I affirm they can the reason is that though uh, although civil administration is fundamentally a natural human uh, and universal, it was always for the people of God. No, the people of God don't need civil administration. It's the world that needs government, not Christians. Christ is our governor, our king, directly. The kingdom of God is theocratic. Christ in us is our law. Civil administration was created to serve Adam's race in a state of integrity. In other words, uh, unfallen. That's ridiculous. If you're unfallen, you're walking with God, as they did in the garden, and there is no need for a human administration at all, because you're, you're the temple of God, and God is present with you and in you. So God rules directly, and you're his avatar, to use an uh, analogy, like the movie. You are God's presence. His, then you are truly, Christians are truly a vicar 
of God or a vicar of Christ. We are the physical temple of, and God dwells in it. We are the manifestation of God physically in creation, especially when we're glorified. Even now, we walk, though we walk in bodies that contain sin and are bodies of clay, flesh, yet, and you'll see this effect sometimes, because the Spirit of God dwells in us, we are indeed the temples of God for those who have been born again. We are the, indeed the temples of God and the, uh, the localized presence of God's Spirit in the world. When we walk someplace, the Spirit of God goes with us in a particular way. When I take a walk, sometimes I do it consciously with God. Sometimes I just take a walk. But God, I'm always walking with God because he's in me. Can't do anything else. So uh, if you're in the perfect state, there's no need for government. God, this is just, this guy just makes things up. This is just garbage. Just the biblical word is scabalon. Scabalon. As Paul said, I caught... Count all that. He's talking about all his learning as scabalon. We have an English expression for that, but it might offend some people. So I won't use it. Bovine excretement. What about consent? Would not Christians have to disregard the non-Christians withholding consent? They likely would. <laughs> so you're going to have the majority of Americans wanting a, a theocratic, absolute dictatorship of one man ruling over them, a Puritan who thinks he's God and makes laws out of thin air. You think they might resist? <laughs> I suspect so. And punish the rest of us for being uh, guilt by association. That's why it's important we resist this stuff. To establish a record that we don't approve of it. Seriously disapprove of it. In fact, I hope, uh, I hope the, the, uh, the black uh, SUVs make a few stops and ask a few questions of Doug Wilson and... Uh, Mr. Wolf, what are you advocating? The overthrow of the United States government? Answer yes or no. Or have you stopped? <laughs> have you stopped advocating the overthrow of the United States government and the Constitution? Answer yes or no. That would be like uh, what certain parties would, how they'd phrase it. So no matter what you say, you're guilty. But no one and no group can withhold consent such that they effectively deny the establishment of a properly constituted commonwealth. Well, so you're saying you're overthrowing a Const properly constituted commonwealth. So nothing other than a theocratic, Puritan, absolute, single-person rule is a properly constituted commonwealth, apparently. See, we're not supposed to overthrow the government because it's of God. The government of Rome, the Roman Empire, Okay, that's enough of that. Let's, let's go to, to Romans chapter 13. And I'll show you that this is all a bunch of scabalon. If you want to follow this man, well, I'm not responsible for you where you end up. But it won't be in a good place, that's for sure. And you'll be responsible for a lot of uh, persecution of Christians. Because this is, this is, if not actual, it's borderline treason. 
they may not be threatening the United States by name, but given January 6th, it doesn't take much for them to come to certain conclusions. The powers that be are a little bit touchy about things like this. Romans, the Apostle Paul. So do you want to take the, the words of the Apostle Paul or do you want to take the words of a wolf? Because this is a wolf. Divine Providence named him a wolf. Indeed, he is. He's a servant of Satan. Sent, apparently, to destroy the church of Jesus Christ in the United States. The true church. Because he's certainly not going to establish his theocratic dictatorship. How many Christians are going to... You're not going to get any real Christians to go for this stuff. Only deceived Calvinists that aren't born again. People like A.D. Robles and Doug Wilson and James White, apparently, and Jeff Durbin, they're already on board because they're deceived. How could a regenerate person abide in this because we've been given the spirit of truth and the love of truth? And we've been given God's word. We will not turn aside from God's word to read this scabalon and follow this. A wolf. We know the shepherd, and we follow him. And another we will not follow, because we know his voice. And this is not his voice. Let every person be in subjection. That's not obedience. Subjection is putting yourself under the authority. The apostles in Acts, in the first several chapters, we have them arresting uh, uh, Peter and John and they're brought before the authorities, and they're ordered to stop preaching Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And they say, whether it is right in, this, in your sight that we, may, uh, that we obey man rather than God, you judge. But for us, we cannot do anything other than proclaim Christ. And what happened? They were punished, and they submitted to the punishment. That's subjection. They didn't rise up to overthrow. They did not fight against the authorities. They did not try to change things. They submitted themselves. They, they obeyed God and submitted themselves to the authorities, even to punishment. Now, we are given the option by Jesus Christ. He says, if they, if they reject you in one city, flee to another. So we have two options. We can submit ourselves to the, uh, the care of God and uh, su subjection to whatever punishment the authorities deal out to us, or we can flee. Overthrowing the state is not an option, as we shall see. For there is, there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. He established authority. Doesn't mean he necessarily established a particular person, but that person is in that position of exercising the authority. We are to be in subject to them. Subjection. For example, during the pandemic, there was a period of time where often in different states, no more than 12 people could meet together. And so, and, and as what should have ruled in, among Christians was love of the brethren. And nobody knew exactly what things were or what happened or what was going on, what the results would be, how bad things would get. And so the... Uh, and the government was flailing about, too. They didn't know. So they came up with some ideas and sought to impose it on us. It started with 15 days to, to halt, the, to bend the curve or halt the spread or whatever they called it, and went on from there. Nevertheless, in those, those cir circumstances, um, there was... Because meeting with others was not totally prohibited, the church could disperse and do that and still function as the church of Jesus Christ, fulfilling the primary commandment to love one another. That's what we should have done. The emphasis is on loving one another, not assembling. If you look up 
Hebrews chapter 10, you'll find out the purpose of assembling. And it is not simply to assemble, unless you're a, a preacher that has a big ego and loves to tell other people what to do. No, the purpose of assembly is to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and to encourage one another and strengthen one another. It's that is not to make one another sick. So what do you do? You rearrange things so that you're not in conflict with the authorities. You, you abide in the commandment to love one another and adapt, overcome, and win to the glory of God in the circumstances. God is glorified when we follow him regardless of circumstances. It shows the power of the gospel. But if you can't do that, if you've got a false form of Christianity and a big ego complex, a Christian prince as your pastor, well, then you've got a serious issue. I suggest you go somewhere else. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. God ordained authority, not the authorities, the authority in general. Civil authority for a wicked, sinful world. And they who, who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Again, like in that particular thing, we could have adapted and done things properly and learned a lot and become better Christians. But rather, you know, we had people that, what did they do? They went to the courts. They went lawsuits, uh, outright disobedience. Well, if you're going to uh, disobey the authorities, it's better to do it quietly than to do it noisy. So if you're noisy and make a public display out of it, they have to respond. They can't overlook it. Foolish people. don't understand anything. Oh, my. Yeah, you want to make a big noise, boast about how you're disobeying authorities and challenging the government. Well, they're going to come around and beat you down because you're a threat. If you're quiet, don't make a noise. Don't uh, overtly uh, oppose them and be peaceable and say, well, OK, well, how can we how can we get how can we cooperate with you to satisfy your requirements but continue to satisfy God's requirements. That's how you deal with things. God always makes a way. If you're willing to listen to him instead of your own egos, your pride. For rulers are not a cause of fear for, those, for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good. And you will have praise from the same. Who is he talking about? Who's the authorities? Well, you had the Jewish authorities who crucified Jesus and were persecuting the saints. And you had the Roman authorities who crucified Jesus and were persecuting the saints. And within a few years, would, have ta would take Paul's head off. And he says, be in subjection. Did any of the apostles rise up against the pagan, wicked Roman Empire? to try to change their laws, to ban abortion? No. Why? Because that's not the mission of the church. What did Jesus tell us to go, do? Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, making disciples of all nations. That's the mission of the church until Christ returns, not something else, not creating a different government. He will create that when he returns. But if you're a, a Calvinist, post-millennial preterist, you don't believe he's coming back. Not really. You don't believe that he will come back and he will establish the kingdom. Because you're post-millennial or amillennial, post same thing in some ways. You don't believe it. In spite of the fact that the early church believed it. They were mostly pre-mill, historic pre-mill. Men like Justin Martyr and 
Irenaeus in the second century. Irenaeus, emphatically so. He would have none of this post-millennial nonsense or Amel either. Uh, he was a very important writer in the second century and a very important Christian since he was the disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of John the Apostle. So he knew when the book of Revelation was written. It wasn't written prior to 70 AD. It was written during the reign of Domitian, around 95. 92 to 95, I believe, according to Irenaeus. Rather than these people that are trying to push it back in some other date to justify their strange eschatology. See, right now, according to the post-millennials, Christ is ruling and reigning today from heaven. Well, when I look around, if that's true, I don't think he's doing a very good job. If, if this is a millennium, I'm not thrilled, let's put it that way. And if Christ is ruling and reigning today, now, on earth, as it is, is in heaven, then why are you fighting against him by trying to change the government? Huh? If you believe God's will is always being done, why are you fighting away against him? Isn't that a little inconsistent? He, therefore, he who resists authority resists the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves for... Uh, I already read that, didn't I? No, I didn't. Yes, here. Uh, for, um, but, if you, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it will bring... Uh, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger that brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. That's the purpose. It's a minister of God to bring wrath on the one who does evil. If you don't want to be on the wrong side of the government, don't do evil. That's what Paul is saying. Speaking of the Roman Empire and the Jewish leadership, which were hostile, utterly hostile to Christians. Rome hadn't gone completely hostile yet. This is prior to, uh, what's his name? But they were not friendly either. They got worse and worse. But still, Christians didn't rise up against the government ever. Those who followed Christ never did. In fact, we were persecuted for not joining the Jewish rebellion against the Romans, both times. This guy would have died in Jerusalem. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection. Again, subjection is not the same as obedience. It is if, if you disobey the government, again, you can either flee to, well, then you're not really disobeying either. But if you disobey the commands of the government in order to keep the commands of God, then you submit to the punishment. That's being in, subject, uh, in subjection to government. You understand? You don't resist them. That doesn't mean you obey them. It means you don't resist. It is non-resistant behavior. It is not civil disobedience. Although civil disobedience carried with it the same idea. But it, uh, civil disobedience was not passive, it was aggressive. It was, it was it trying to change the government. Whereas what Christ calls us to is something different. We're not of this kingdom. We're of his kingdom pursuing his ends. And it's only when the government interferes with that that we run into a conflict. We're not here to change the government. We're not here to change the laws. Those who say so are not following Christ, nor the example of Christ and the apostles. None of them tried to change the laws of the state or even dealt with those issues. Those are of the world. You're calling people out of the world onto Christ, and he will change them. The world that stays out there, that doesn't want to hear the gospel, that doesn't want to follow Christ, well, that's, they get what they choose, which is they're sinners and the victims of sin. So, 
Uh, flee from that to Christ. If you don't want Christ, well, then the wrath of God abides on you, as it's said in John 3, 38. For this reason, you also pay taxes, for the rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Not consciously, but nevertheless, that he uses them for that purpose. Render uh, to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom. That's like border taxes. I've seen Christians try to get around that. Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Uh, in other words, even uh, evil rulers, we should render due honor to the office, uh, even if not that the individual himself is unworthy. Then you're not honoring the man, you're honoring the position. It's like in the military. When you salute somebody, an officer, for example, you're not, uh, you're just being in subjection uh, to them, acknowledging their position. You're not acknowledging their character. They could be, you know, the lowest of the low, but you still salute them. You, you give honor to whom honor is due because of their position, not because of their character. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, perhaps he will convict them of their sinfulness. which would be appropriate. Say, so God in us, he can do what he wants with people. He'll deal with sinners. Given the option, what, what do we do? We tell people about Jesus Christ and the gospel, the free gift of salvation through faith in Christ, the gift of eternal life. What, what is all this garbage compared to that? What is government, earthly things, compared to the gift of eternal life, the free gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. It is nothing but scabalon. Dung. Worth nothing. Unimportant. It's a temporary nuisance that manifests the grace and glory of God especially with his saints overcoming the world. What is our victory? Faith. Faith is our victory. Faith in Jesus Christ, abiding in Christ through faith, regardless of the circumstances God has chosen to put us in. We don't get to choose what country we're born in, what time we're born into, or anything like that. doesn't matter. God is at work everywhere in his people, in all places, constantly, and all of this is to God's glory, and it shows the power and glory of Christ and God's grace in Christ. In our salvation, we have overcome the world. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. How do we overcome? By our faith. Just hang in there, hold to him, and because he is coming too. So it's, we don't have to do this for long. Nobody has to, to endure for more than, well, generally 70, 80 years. So you don't have to wait. Nobody has to wait 2,000 years for Christ to come. You don't have to wait until as soon as you pass away, you're immediately in the presence of God with Christ. You, just, you leave your body and you're, you're sitting at the right hand. We are Even now, we are already seated at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. Or don't you believe the scriptures? So what is what is all this trash about earthly governments? Who cares? What do they have to do with Jesus Christ? That you would, would make this a primary thing. It is foolishness. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, or this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, for love does no wrong to neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. And this do, knowing the same, that it is already in the hour that you are to awaken from sleep. For now the salvation, now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. Yes, that's always true, isn't it? The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing, that's partying, partying, going from party to party, <clears throat> from tavern to tavern, from nightclub to nightclub, and drunkenness, but in not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Yes, let us do that rather than try to overthrow the government and install a Christian theocratic, well, this couldn't be a, possibly a Christian man because no Christian would, would take such a position as tyrant. No Christian wants to be tyrant and dominate his brothers and sisters. As Jesus said, it shall not be so. That's how the pagans do things. It shall not be so among you after he washed his disciples' feet. I have set an example for you. <sighs> so, um, a wolf has written this book. If you want to follow wolves, they will eat you because you're a sheep. You belong to the Lord Jesus. You are a sheep of his pastor. You stay away from wolves. They're bad for you. Sheep are pretty dumb, though. But sheep know the voice of their shepherd, and they will not follow another. So if you follow Stephen Wolf, I would say you're probably not one of the Lord's sheep because he's not your shepherd. So you listen to other voices. Don't do it. Follow Christ. If you don't know Christ, cry out to him to save you. For all who call upon the name of the Lord, truly call upon him for salvation. To be reconciled with God shall be saved.